some viewers may find upsetting. For years, he was a TV and radio superstar and a friend of the rich and famous. He was pretty much ingrained in the nation's consciousness. Nobody tells me to do anything, baby. Oh, right. I tell them what's happening. He had friends in the very highest echelons of society. But since his death in 2011, the sinister truth about Jimmy Savile has been revealed. He was just sadistic in what he wanted to do and what he wanted other people to do. Jimmy Savile, once one of the nation's favorite stars, adored by millions of TV viewers, is now regarded as one of the country's most prolific sex offenders. His preying on young victims and just how he was allowed to carry on abusing children for decades are crimes that shook Britain. On the 9th of November, 2011, a funeral cortege moved slowly through the city of Leeds. The streets lined by a respectful public. They weren't there to say goodbye to royalty or a head of state, however. They'd come to pay their respects to a DJ, charity worker, and much-loved icon. It was absolutely worshipped by thousands and thousands of people. You couldn't move in Leeds when it was a funeral. The seats were packed solid, you know, traffic was stopped, everything stopped. But to this afternoon, Sir Jimmy Savile's gold coffin made its way down Cookridge Street in Leeds. I can't think of any media celebrity today who is more famous than he was then. Flags at half-mast outside Leeds General Infirmary, where he'd raised so much for charity. He was a demigod. Just days later, however, stories began to emerge that confounded the country. Rumors that had circulated for years were coming true. Jimmy Savile, once the nation's favorite entertainer, was in fact a rapist, a sadist, and a pedophile. Jimmy Savile was born in Leeds on the 31st of October, 1926. As a young man, he worked as a coal miner before an injury forced him to change career. He became an entertainer and began running several nightclubs in the north of England. It wasn't long before his reputation preceded him. When Jimmy Savile first came to Leeds, no one knew him. And after a month, everybody in Leeds knew him or have heard of him because they are outlandish things that he used to do. The way he dressed, the way he did his hair, for instance, you know, just, just to get himself noticed. You know, if he came to our house, there'd obviously be a couple of, I'd say a couple of dozen, it could be a couple of hundred people all outside the house and round his car. And, you know, so you'd obviously walk around with a big chest and your head held high, you know, saying, oh, is that my uncle, sort of thing. We never went out saying, oh, we've got a famous uncle called Jimmy Savile or all like that. He was just Uncle Jimmy and that, and that were it, really. He was a well-known figure in the north of England. He was a, a sort of an amateur disc jockey who hadn't really broken into television yet. And he introduced dancing to records, which had never happened before. He started for younger people on a, on a lunchtime, just dancing to records, and it really took off. Jimmy Savile began working at the Locarno nightclub in Leeds in the late 1950s. Dennis Lemon was employed by the club and became Savile's unofficial minder. He tried to give himself this reputation of a tough guy in a restaurant, all this, that and other. And I think he was as soft as anything. He just wanted somebody at his shoulders in case somebody did take a swing. Even as his showbiz career was taking off, Jimmy Savile began to be dogged by accusations. When I was talking to the assistant manager one night and Jimmy came through and through the door, and uh, evening Jimmy, you know, and just walked straight past us. And I said, what's wrong with Jimmy? He said, he's in a bad mood. He said, oh, he's got a lot on his mind. I said, what's wrong with him? No, he's in court tomorrow. What for? He says, uh, 
messing about with girls. And I thought, well, he may have taken one out and, as the phrase goes, tried it on and it didn't work and they've complained about him, you know. And uh, that was that. Nothing else said. Until next time I was on duty, a couple of nights later, and happened to say, how did Jimmy go on in court? So I said, it never got to court. It got thrown out. Case dropped. And I said, how did he manage that one then? He said, uh, same as he did last time. He said he paid him off. Having narrowly escaped any charges by paying off his accuser's family, Savile apparently felt no need to curb his behaviour. What's amazing is, is how brazen he was, how public he was, even then. I think he's just a, an individual who probably felt that he was fairly untouchable. I mean, you know, he was, he was quite an imposing figure. In 1968, 15-year-old Guy Marsden, Savile's nephew, along with three friends, headed south from Leeds in search of adventure. The young teenagers found themselves at Euston Station in London, where they were approached by two men. I would have said about 30 years old, rock and roll, with leather jackets and long hair and that. And they were just saying, do you want to come to our place and that? You've got to try to remember that there were no such thing as perverts. There were, but you, you didn't hear them. Don't even a name paedophile out then, I don't think. So we just thought, oh, the like us, you know. So anyway, we ended up going with these back to their flat. At the time, Guy and his friends were unaware of the motives of the two men. Only recently has he found out the truth. These people would pick people up from train stations, as in younger people. We'd then go to their houses. And then the, the ones higher up the chain would come to these houses to see who they'd picked up, to take them elsewhere to do whatever they were going to do with them. Only days later, Guy was stunned when Jimmy Savile himself visited the flat. His first thought was that his family had tracked him down and they had sent Savile to bring him back to Leeds. The truth would be far worse. And then my Uncle Jimmy came in, and he came in with his vicar and some kids. I thought that my Uncle Jimmy had caught me there because, I mean, I was proper scared if you know what I mean I was terrified if you want but now I'm 60 I think he didn't catch me I caught him only recently has Guy been made aware that Jimmy Savile far from being a lone predator seemingly played an active role in supplying children to a network of child abusers in London now I have no conception of paedophilia or child abuse at all, neither as any other three. So to us, our thoughts were, it's a party. You know, the people who live there, the man and lady who live there are going to have a party. And it ended up where we were like huddled together, four of us, and then these little kids would come over to us. As a naive 15-year-old, Guy was never completely aware of the role he played but it appears he and his friends were unwitting accomplices in the group's depraved activities. You'd have been talking from six year old up to, I'd have said 10 at most. So there were young children. And then every so often, they'd, they'd, one of them would go, two of them would go. Still ne never thought, never thought nothing whatsoever about it. These parties would last for days with various men from all sections of society arriving and taking one or more young children into bedrooms and abusing them. I think most decent people find it incomprehensible that these sort of organisations, rings, whatever we want to call them, exist. But no less incomprehensible than why would anybody abuse a child? That The fact that people come together to do it seems in a way somewhat more scary because very often we're talking about people from, well, certainly people from all walks of life, but including people from the upper echelons of society. To this day, Guy is still unclear as to exactly what role Savile played in the so-called parties. My Uncle Jimmy saw him. I mean, he didn't even speak to us. 
acknowledges it and every now and again you might have got a nod. He just seemed to come in, flitter about, you know, whatever they were doing, bringing little ones in and stuff like that, and then he'd go. I've recently found out that I were going to get, well, the police and things have called it groomed to do what the people down London were doing, i.e. getting the kids and probably grown, you know, old, older girls and older boys to go to these parties up here in Leeds and places like that. In 1969, after a year in the capital, Guy returned to Leeds. Even now, over 40 years later, having witnessed the sordid events in London, he considers that he had a lucky escape. When I think back, I cringe, because I think he could have ended up in the bottom of Thames. They could have done out against you, saying you're a bit lonely or something. I think it's only because I was, you know, Jimmy Sowell's nephew, my uncle Jimmy's nephew, that not like that did happen. As the 1960s drew to a close, it would appear that Savile's appetite for abuse showed no signs of slowing down. As his showbiz career gained momentum, so did his ability to evade the attention of the authorities. I had a huge amount of power. In everything in life, he used it to get his own advantage. This is the work I do. Stream all episodes only on Amazon Prime. Votes are in on the largest UK consumer survey in product innovation. And the product of the year in the healthy yogurt category is... Ta-da! Muller Light Fruitopolis. Sumptuous strawberry layered over creamy tasting Greek style yogurt. And what's more, it's fat free. I've seen real benefits from my patients using Sensitime Repair and Protect. It is an amazing technology. It actually does help repair sensitive teeth. If you have exposed dentine, you could get sensitivity. Sensitime Repair and Protect helps repair the sensitive part of the tooth by actually forming a layer of material which is harder than the actual dentine surface itself, reducing sensitivity in the long term. I recommend Sensitime Repair and Protect to my patients. It actually delivers to help repair sensitive teeth. What do you think will happen if we change the numbers on the right-hand side? There'll be more. Do you want to give it a go? 18. Because that's how old my big brother is. Oh. My age. Uh, let's do... Oh, my dog's age. I don't know what my dog's age is. Let's do five. Help your child learn code with the Barclays Digital Eagle at barclayscoplayground.co.uk. Take it off, amore. Take it off. No. You took off my pepperonis. Love your pepperonis, but she's here now. Am I too thick? You're a pizza, and we're done. Oh, mamma mia, no. Don't let food hang around. But me don't. Help keep teeth clean and healthy. Eat, drink, chew, extra. Right, Mother's Day lunch. I could roast a succulent British dry-aged beef joint. Or I could cook a British pork leg joint. She'll like that. I know. I'll cook her favourite British whole chicken. Delicious and moist. Now, I just need to figure out how to switch this oven on. Corn mint is not just a healthy source of protein, it also makes delicious chilli. A healthy source of protein. Get a free EE TV box with unlimited broadband before 7th of April, and EE will throw in a free tablet worth £100 so you can watch telly anywhere in the house. I put a spell on you. Because you're mine. Stop the things you do. <laughs> What's up? I The Suzuki Swift. You really must see one. 
the Suzuki Swift SZ3. Now available with 0% APR representative and no deposit on Suzuki personal contract purchase. Wednesday on Channel 5. Are we rolling? Roll up, roll up. We've got all the weddings, hairstyles, mullets are hilarious. betrayals, <laughs> explosions and Harold. <laughs> For Neighbours 30th. We did 30 years ago, seriously. The stars reunite. 10 p.m. Wednesday on Channel 5. Now on Channel 5, it's Britain's Worst Crimes, which chronicles a distressing catalogue of abuse that some viewers may find upsetting. Jimmy Savile, once a cherished national icon, is now vilified as an evil sexual predator who hid behind a smokescreen of celebrity in a career that lasted decades. After running several nightclubs across the country, Savile began working as a DJ, first at Radio Luxembourg, and then, in 1968, joining the BBC. One of his early roles was presenter of a topical radio discussion programme called Speakeasy. He was the presenter. It was uh, another one of Jimmy's PR operations, you know, Jimmy Savile is king, and he certainly was on that programme, as he was on everything he appeared on at the time. And within the BBC, the whole organisation was at his beck and call. Had a huge amount of power, he certainly knew it, and constantly worked on building it round him. In everything in life, he used it to get his own advantage. After the recording of one particular episode of Speakeasy, Dave was offered a lift home by Jimmy Savile. As they approached Leicester, Savile suggested they pull into a service area for a rest. So he suggested he was going to get his head down for an hour, and as it was early evening, I said, fine, I'd go into the service area and have a meal. Did just that. Came back after about, oh, three quarters of an hour to an hour. Tapped on the window of the motorhome to let him know I was here and lo and, lo and behold two young girls 14 15 year olds clambered out of the back looking all scruffy and flustered followed by Jim they were scrambling as if they were trying to get away from something I know my suspicion but the fact is that they were running from something so he didn't say anything. The girls went away. We got back in the motorhome. I said, who were they? Oh, fans, it often happens. But then, total silence. Never said a word. The more and more I thought about it, I thought, I need to tell somebody what my suspicions are. Dave raised the matter with a colleague, but was shocked by the response. They had a word with his line manager who'd said, uh, it's Jimmy Savile. We can't do anything or say anything about that. You know, we both need to keep our jobs. After that, I never watched him on television once. If he came on television, I switched it off. I never watched another Jimmy Savile programme after that. In 1975, Savile began presenting the show that would make him a household name. Jim will fix it. The programme was broadcast on Saturday evenings and ran for almost two decades. At its peak, the show attracted viewing figures of 15 million, with the production team opening almost 5,000 letters a day. I got letters just bombarding me. There were so many letters, and it was up to me to sift them and give them to Jim for his decision. But it was, it was hard, but there was a lot of letters and it just grew like Topsy. And that's how it all started. Despite his on-screen persona, Savile's attitude to children was apparently different when the cameras were turned off. He did not like children at all. He tolerated them, but that's about as far as it went for the value of the programme. I think all children should be eaten at birth. That's for sure. He had a set rules and he knew how far he could go. They might have sat on the arm of the chair, but that's as near as it got. What is apparent now, though, is that this seeming aversion to children was no more than a camouflage to ward off suspicion. 
a device Savile used throughout his life to stay ahead of the rumours that dogged him. Abusers often are the most credible and charming people that you could meet. They're often very hardworking. They often hold positions within authority, within society, of, of some standing. The other common denominator, of course, is that they are highly dangerous to children and can be highly dangerous when cornered. And I think that, you know, there was a man who clearly could be as charming as charming could be, but also was both highly dangerous, extremely threatening and very intimidating when he needed to be. Well, there's only one thing I can do now, and as if you, if you cheat down there, Mr. Cameron, I'll slap a bell at that. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. As well as his TV and radio career, Savile was renowned for his charity work, raising millions of pounds for several charities, including the Leeds General Infirmary and Stoke Mandeville National Spinal Injury Centre. Jim, because he was Jim, liked high-profile things. Stoke Mandeville was very high-profile. It was world-famous for its treatment of the paralysed. Leeds General Infirmary was a big teaching hospital so he generated to things that had quite a high publicity value. And as a result, he benefited, but so did the hospitals. Jimmy Savile may have raised around 40 million in his lifetime for charity, but looking back, I think it's, it's easy to now see that his charity work was a very convenient camouflage for his activities and helped him gain access to vulnerable you know, young people, in fact, in hospitals, in children's homes, in events linked to the BBC, and indeed, of course, his involvement with Broadmoor and the fact that he was actually given the keys to Broadmoor. Broadmoor, the high security psychiatric hospital in Berkshire, is home to some of the UK's most notorious criminals. Past occupants include Peter Sutcliffe, Charles Bronson, and Ronnie Cray. Savile had volunteered at Broadmoor for years, but in 1988, he was given a senior role, along with a house on site, and incredibly, access to patients. The fact that he was given keys to a place such as Broadmoor, that he was allowed to walk the the hospital wards where there were vulnerable children in Stoke Mandeville and other places, again, is incomprehensible. And yet nobody, nobody seems to be taking responsibility. Like many adults who abuse children, I think Savile preyed on the vulnerable and the weak. We still don't know the full sort of degree of what, what he did, but it seems to be the case that he may have even abused disabled children in hospitals. We now know there were people, you know, in certain hospitals and at Broadmoor and elsewhere who were suspicious or indeed had had whispers or even had had complaints from some victims, but who I think felt that they would never be believed. You know, if you're a friend of the Prime Minister, you're photographed with these people, you are, you know, in the public eye, the idea that you might at the same time be abusing children is monstrous. Here we go with what's called a medical breakthrough. He had, if you like, all the establishment connections. Even though he was eccentric, even though he was like a complete weirdo, that he was actually, he was actually, he, he, he was actually fated. As well as having almost unrestricted access to Broadmoor and its patients, Savile also managed to secure regular visits to Duncroft School in Surrey, a residential school that housed young girls who had been sent there by the courts. The girls at Duncroft were certainly, although intelligent, were vulnerable. But Savile, I think, also worked on the principle that the mixture of his fame and the fact that he was treating them to things like trips to the BBC or trips out in his Rolls Royce, that this was if you like, a, a thrill that, you know, that, uh, they, that they wouldn't get from, uh, from their normal lives in, a, in effect in an institution. So I think, he, I think he gambled on that, that that would, inf at the time, would actually guarantee their silence. 
anything that moved seemed to be a potential victim for Savile. But he clearly also was clever at targeting lots of very vulnerable victims as well. Girls in a school for troubled girls would have been, you know, manna from heaven. In 1994, two women who had been pupils at Duncroft approached the Sunday Mirror newspaper, alleging that Savile had abused them as teenagers. They weren't looking for money. They merely wanted to see Savile exposed because they thought you know, he, was a, he was a hypocrite and find it hard to believe that he was almost you know, deified in some circles and, and that he, he was so well in with you know, very prominent, eminent people. Although the paper was keen to run the story, the two women were understandably wary of the costly and emotionally intrusive libel case that would inevitably follow. They decided not to proceed. Once again, Savile's power and reputation had served him well. I had no doubt about the veracity of their stories, but they had lost their nerve. In one case, she still had the, the courage herself, but she didn't want the embarrassment of both her past life coming out and or indeed of her being subjected to uh, you know to what would have been a merciless uh, cross examination by a QC for Savile one had would have had to tell them that was what was going to happen the second woman didn't want to be the the lone witness but also said and I will never forget this because it, it I think, I think it reflects a theme that we now know was common among Savile's victims. She said, who's going to believe me, an ex-approved school girl against Jimmy Savile with all his fame, all his money, and that being a house guest of Margaret Thatcher at number 10 and Chequers. And with hindsight, one, one knew that she was probably right. Although we didn't, we didn't run the story, some weeks later, I had a phone call from a QC George Carman, at, at the time, then the most famous l libel QC in Britain. George Carman, QC, was one of the country's leading barristers, acting for both celebrities and national newspapers. To the best of his family's knowledge, he had never formally represented Jimmy Savile. My father spoke to Paul Carman. He was then editor of the Sunday Mirror. Uh, and my father had uh, worked with him in terms of giving uh, defamation advice in five or six different cases, I think. So he knew him reasonably well, and they'd also socialised a bit. So he phoned him to, on the pretext of talking about something to do with uh, a libel action with reference to the mirror. And my understanding from Paul is that at the end of the conversation, my father, apropos of nothing, suddenly introduced an observation saying, Jimmy Savile's very grateful that you didn't publish that story about Duncroft, and Paul was astonished. I was, for a second, I think, taken aback that George Carman knew about it. Um, so my reaction you know, to George was, well, how do you know about it, George? You can only know because Savile's spoken to you. And he sort of gave a rather affirmative sort of chuckle. and. My response was, well, well George, even though we, we couldn't prove the story because the two women involved lost their nerve, I actually believe them. And George Carman paused and chuckled again and said, Paul, I suspect you may well be right. I can quite understand he was astonished because, as far as he was concerned, only three people in the world knew about that story apart from the two girls. Uh, that was himself the legal advisor and the journalist who wrote the story. So the fact that my father knew about it, and therefore Savile knew about it, and that my father introduced it in conversation in this way, he found deeply surprising, as indeed do I. He had friends in the very highest echelons of society. Princess Diana and him were friends. Nobody messed with Jimmy Savile because he had connections that were unique, if you like, to, to somebody in his position. It was like he was the puppet master controlling everything that was going on. By the end of the 1990s, after a glittering career, Savile's showbiz star was fading. And whilst his TV appearances grew less frequent, his near constant charity work earned him a knighthood. His armor of respectability 
was complete. It would be over 20 years later until the full horrifying truth emerged. He enjoyed seeing pain inflicted and humiliation, I suppose. Get yourself a new deal in the biggest ever BT sale. We've cut more prices than ever before, so you can now get our lowest ever price on BT Broadband Extra and unlimited UK evening and weekend calls for your entire 12-month contract. And what's more, it's on both standard BT Broadband Extra and Fibre Optic BT Infinity Extra. Don't miss out on the biggest ever BT sale. Switch today and get the package that's right for you. Call 0800 005 800 or visit bt.com slash sale. You know, Vincent. It's Vicky. Winner Bingo's got so many winners, yet somehow I've still got all my clothes on. Your clothes are going to come off when someone wins, aren't they? Yes! Yes, they are! Bingo! There goes the neighborhood. Bingo! <sighs> Double bingo! <laughs> Oops. Oh. Deposit £10, get £60 to play with. Superb, and that smile is so white. How did you do it so quickly? It's a toothpaste. Colgate Max White Optic. Optic brighteners reflect light to whiten your teeth instantly after brushing. Colgate Max White Optic, a beautiful whiter smile instantly. Try with new Colgate Pro Clinical Max White One Electric Toothbrush for a brighter, whiter smile. Now you can play the health lottery for even less with our new 50p quick pick draws every Tuesday and Friday. That's four times cheaper than Lotto and you could win up to £25,000. And remember, you're seven times more likely to win our health lottery jackpot than Lotto, guaranteed. Quick pick is the fastest way to play the health lottery. You'll receive your numbers in seconds and you can reuse your quick pick card for every draw in any store. The health lottery, you've got to play to win. Now from just 50p a ticket. been done a certain way for years doesn't mean it can't be improved that's why i started my online estate agency tepelo.com hello we have all the services you'd expect from a high street agent but online including valuations your own sale manager and more plus we advertise your home on both right moves and zoopla and at a fixed price of under 600 pounds you could save thousands too afternoon sarah visit tepelo.com now for a free valuation Right, Mother's Day lunch. I could roast a succulent British dry-aged beef joint. Or I could cook a British pork leg joint. She'll like that. I know. I'll cook her favourite British whole chicken. Delicious and moist. Now, I just need to figure out how to switch this oven on. Monday on Channel 5. So you're a penguin? It's the penguin. I know the man. And that means you need me. I'm not going anywhere until I cut penguin's throat. Gotham returns with a special feature-length episode Monday at 9 on Channel 5. Returning to Britain's worst crimes now on Channel 5, which chronicles a distressing catalogue of abuse that some viewers may find upsetting. Jimmy Savile was a national icon until his death in 2011. He is now regarded as a wicked, predatory sex offender who used his connections and reputation to deflect any allegations of wrongdoing. However, the public persona of Savile, the entertainer and showman, was at odds with how people actually viewed him when the cameras were turned off. Savile had long been regarded as a pretty suspicious figure by a lot of people in, um, in journalism, in Fleet Street, at the BBC. One, I'm very boring. I don't do drugs, I don't do underage sex, I don't do any of them things that they print in papers today. 
I think I've found several shifty, grubby, mock humility. He almost invited you to think of him as a slightly grubby, eccentric individual. I hope that cigar is not lit that you have in your hand. No, it's not lit. Jimmy Savile. Did no. the doctors not tell you to get off that? Nobody tells me to do anything, baby. Oh, I right. tell them what's happening. Oh. I feel that, yes, he, he hid his darkness in the light. You've been doing Jim will fix it for 20 years. Did anybody ever fix anything for you? Uh, yes, because my case comes up next Thursday. Right, and I hope you get off it. <laughs> Not a big change if I get put away. <laughs> he didn't have a personality. It was almost robotic. Not in his movements. But in his actions, he never ever showed any emotion other than when it was that false smile that he had when he was buttering you up on screen or on air. Never had showed any emotion of any kind whatsoever. A lot of people didn't like him. They didn't like him because of the way a lot of people called him creepy. But he used to go round the wards saying things like, uh, Oh, you're beautiful and give me your hand and he'd take their hand and he'd kiss the back of their hand and it's yeah he, they, he wasn't terribly popular with the staff whilst people harbored suspicions about Savile his status as a celebrity and fundraiser meant he was never called to account allowing him to continue to prey on children both as an individual and also as part of a group of child abusers Stephen was only seven when he began to be abused at home. My father started it, um, started being very um, violent. He used to drink quite heavily. Um, and it started from there. I suppose over quite a short space of time it escalated quite quickly from you know just being hit um, to being kissed and touched and I don't even know how many months um, before others were involved as the abuse got worse Stephen was handed over to an organized paedophile ring Stephen was abused by the group for the next nine years. He would be collected from home at any time, day or night. And on occasions, he would even be picked up from school. He was taken to various locations, including houses and hotels, where he, and often other boys, would be subjected to the most appalling sexual abuse by one or more men. Nobody questioned it, and you know, sometimes it was during the day or the evening or at night or weekends, it's, that was just part of life, really. And <laughs> nobody said anything, not a word. It's strange, because they never said, don't tell. You know, you hear people say, oh yeah, we were told not to tell. Nobody ever actually said that. Um, but it was made very clear that if you broke the rules, um, or if you went against the group, you would just disappear and no one would care. Occasionally, Stephen would be brought to the group to be told that guests would be joining them. On more than one occasion, the guests would include Jimmy Savile. You didn't always know beforehand. Um, sometimes we were told, as so we were, you know, as I've been taken um, to wherever it happened to be, that there'd be a guest coming that evening or that day or whenever it was, um, but not always. Um, no names were ever used, you know, just didn't use names at all. Um, and yeah, he came probably a couple of times a year over several years, just odd occasions. You know, there was nothing different about the event, it just that there was somebody different there. Did you have a you directly? Yes. Yeah. He was just sadistic in what he wanted to do and 
what he wanted other people to, to do. Yeah, just evil and um, enjoyed seeing pain inflicted and humiliation, I suppose. It was hard to comprehend um, because you know who it is when you're, you're sat watching TV and he's on the TV and, you know, that's, it's just really, that is a strange feeling. I think all of us were just objects and just the best way I can describe it is just sweets in a bag that you hand round and, and share. We meant nothing, we meant nothing at all. Stephen's abuse at the hands of the group stopped when he was 16. Only recently has he been able to talk about his horrific ordeal. Following the Savile revelations, he reported his abuse to the police. It's a scary prospect. It's probably more comfortable to not believe things sometimes than to confront them. Um, but we know that organised crime of this kind exists and again we need the police the authorities to have more resources in order to to break them and to establish that the abuse of children in 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 any form and by any perpetrator organized or disorganized is never ever acceptable i believe that as more survivors speak out and many of us are the authorities will be compelled to act it might be a long battle but i think it is more than a battle i think it's a war that we're in and it's a war to protect our children tragically for victims like stephen savile's position as showbiz royalty as well as his charity fundraising once again ensured the rumors and gossip about his behavior remained exactly that it would only be after Savile had died that the shocking nature of his crimes would be laid bare. It was good while it lasted, reads Jimmy Savile's headstone. The same can now be said of his reputation. Jimmy Savile is now regarded as one of the most prolific sex offenders this country has ever seen. His reign of depravity lasted from the 1950s until his death in 2011. Throughout his life, he convinced most people he was nothing but an eccentric. But in 2009, allegations of abuse at Duncroft School forced the police into action. Savile was interviewed under caution at his office at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. When the police are investigating somebody about a serious crime, and this is a very serious crime, the su suspect would generally, surely, always be taken to a police station where they would be interviewed under, under caution. So that made it unusual immediately, and again, probably emphasized that the person in control of that interview was Jimmy Savile. It was not the police. From what's coming out in the press, and most recently the, the, the transcript of his interview with Surrey Police, the tone of the interview is one of almost, I'm sorry I've got to ask you this again, but you know, we've, had, we've had these allegations made to us, which is not really a, you know, a very confident way of, of, of putting a, an allegation to get a, a structured response. As, as well as his obvious denials of any wrongdoing were the undercurrent of threats and intimidation within the interview. I mean, he virtually said, that he would have them in the courts if they messed with him. The authorities decided that given the lack of evidence, any pursuit of Savile was futile and the charges were dropped. One of the last chances to bring one of Britain's most prolific child abusers to justice was lost.
the Mercedes-Benz C-Class from £309 per month. If you fall ill abroad, we'll help find a doctor who speaks your language. Just part of the Kiss and Make Better service we deliver daily. American Express. This Mother's Day, give the best British film of the year. My machine will work. Alan! Benedict Cumberbatch and Kira Knightley. Academy Award winning The Imitation Game. Mmm, a chewy caramel cup. And hazelnuts. Mmm, a creamy filling. And chocolate. But all together is best of all. Toffee Fee. Together, it's just the greatest fun. There's so much fun in Toffee Fee. New Oxo Herbs and More, The Magic Touch. My new Muller Bliss Corner. Greek-style yogurt that's whipped. A touch of strawberry. Mmm, so creamy and sheer bliss. New Muller Bliss Corner. Only 10.39. Little surprises. Just because something's been done a certain way for years doesn't mean it can't be improved. That's why I started my online estate agency, tepolo.com. Hello! We have all the services you'd expect from a high street agent, but online, including valuations, your own sale manager, and more. Plus, we advertise your home on both Rightmove and Zoopla. And at a fixed price of under £600, you could save thousands too. Afternoon, Sarah. Visit tepolo.com now for a free valuation. This the lamb is ridiculously good. For the little price of only £7.79. Other vacuums may have see-through bins now, but they all still lose suction because their filters clog. But with our sonic tips oscillating at 5,000 hertz, only Dyson Kinetic signs won't lose suction. Now you can get up to £110 off the latest Dyson floor care technology when you trade in any vacuum. Available at participating retailers. Tonight on Channel 5, escape to a place where dreams are created and nightmares made. It's not the person I thought it was. He was really being quite intimidating. As soon as he got what he wanted, he was out. A brand new three-part documentary, Holiday Love Rats Exposed, tonight at 9 on Channel 5. We're returning to Britain's worst crimes now on Channel 5, which chronicles a distressing catalogue of abuse that some viewers may find upsetting. Jimmy Savile died in October 2011. Even after his death, a veil of secrecy covered the truth about his activities. In mid-December 2011, I got a call from a BBC contact of mine who told me that there were various people working at the BBC who were unhappy about the fact that a Newsnight investigation into Savile had been axed in what were described to me as mysterious circumstances. So I did some digging um, over a period of about a week, and I discovered that indeed there had been a BBC Newsnight investigation into Savile, and it had been axed. It was made clear to me that several witnesses, middle-aged women, had come forward uh, and some of them had spoken on the record about abuse that they had suffered uh, at the hands of Savile on BBC premises. So uh, I put this to the BBC press office uh, about three or four days before Christmas 2011. It took them 24 hours, but they did confirm that they had conducted this investigation. They told me it had been dropped for uh, editorial reasons. I therefore had confirmation that the investigation had taken place, I knew what its contents were, 
um, and I uh, tried to sell that story to seven national newspapers over the next two weeks. Despite the robust evidence backing up the allegations, not a single newspaper decided to run the story. An executive from one very well-known newspaper told me that, in fact, uh, his editor had also heard stories about Savile, but decided that because he'd only been dead for about two months by this point, it would be in bad taste to run the story. The doors closed, really, and the, uh, the story was sort of of no interest to any of them, which, which amazed me. I suddenly remembered that there was one person who not only might have had some knowledge of Savile as an individual, but um, who was uh, you know, sure to run the story because he has a reputation as a mischief maker. That person is Richard Ingrams, the editor of the Oldie magazine. He'd previously edited Private Eye for about 25 years. I rang Richard Ingrams, and uh, within 30 seconds, he said that he wanted to take the story and he did indeed publish the allegations in full in the February 2012 issue of the Oldie. The Oldie article was the, was the first occasion when any of the, uh, the allegations against Savile were, were published in full. On the 4th of October 2012, ITV broadcast Exposure, the other side of Jimmy Savile. For the first time, the whole country was aware of the allegations against the disgraced star. I think everybody in Leeds watched it. And, uh, not, you know, it's not very nice to, you know, someone that you liked and trusted um, being such a character. I suppose my feelings were one of smugness, self-satisfaction. There you are, I told you so. Disappointment that it had taken so long. Disappointment that the guy had died so he couldn't face justice, but happy that it had come out. The day after exposure was broadcast, the Metropolitan Police launched Operation Utri, looking into the actions of Jimmy Savile, as well as numerous other allegations of historic sexual abuse. The Metropolitan Police and the NSPCC painted a picture of abuse on an almost industrial scale. Over 450 individuals have since come forward to allege that Savile abused them. Most were under 18 when the offences took place. It doesn't matter how much money you raise for charity. If you are at the same time abusing children, abusing disabled people, robbing them of their dignity, robbing them of their childhood, making them incredibly unhappy, you know, you can only be a bad person and your legacy will always be poisonous. I think the Jimmy Savile outrage undoubtedly has a legacy. I mean, it has the legacy that, if you like, the can of worms is open, you know. The, the extent of abuse within society now is beginning to be accepted. You know, Jimmy Savile was one offender he doubtless abused thousands of people during the course of his, his lifetime. But we know that there are many millions of other people in this country who have suffered abuse at the hands of all sorts of other, other people. And the legacy that should follow such an outrage is that we don't allow this to remain, be swept under the carpet any longer. I think it's helped alert the British public to the scale of child abuse not just involving celebrities, but involving other corruptors and destroyers of young lives. I think that it probably means that the prosecuting authorities and the police now take complaints or evidence of abuse far more seriously. The police have been fantastic, because that was a nerve-wracking experience. And positives, I suppose, for my own life, because I'm now much more grounded with it, I suppose. I know what triggers me, I know what doesn't. Um, it's easier to live with now. Um, and hopefully that's going to enable me to get another relationship at, at some point.
find it disturbing that political leaders who were, for example, so keen to call for the Leveson inquiry into misconduct in the press aren't doing the same for an overarching judicial inquiry into the much bigger and life-damaging consequences of multi-institutional failures in, you know, uh, over child abuse going back you know, 30, 40, 50 years. In October 2012, the elaborate headstone that marked Savile's final resting place in the North Yorkshire Cemetery where he was buried was torn down. He now lies in an unmarked grave. The staggering scale of Savile's abuse continues to grow, and questions still remain about how he was able to prey on young, vulnerable children for over 50 years. I think that is a reflection of how society views the crimes, that they'd rather they didn't think about them. And, you know, oh, Jimmy was that way. Well, Jimmy was a rapist and a child abuser. That's established beyond doubt. Lots of people knew nobody did anything about it. That's, that's the real outrage.